Hello and welcome to the week in 60 minutes, brought to you by Spectator TV and broadcast on this Thursday, the 1st of February 2024. My name is Freddie Gray and I will be your host today. On the show this week, we will be talking about stubbing out, or stubbed out, which is the cover line of this week's Spectator, Kate Andrews on uh, the Tory smoking ban and the threat to liberty. We will then talk to Katie Balls and Anthony Selden about the week in politics. And then we'll talk to our wonderful columnist Lionel Shriver about Donald Trump's trials and particularly his case or the case against him from E. Jean Carroll. After that, we'll turn our attention to the Middle East and specifically the nefarious activities of Iran. I will be discussing that with Charlie Gamble. And lastly, we'll talk about Xi Jinping, who is arguably, or probably even, the most powerful human being on the planet at the moment. Uh, Charles Parson has written a book review about the way he thinks and the way the Chinese Communist Party thinks. We'll be discussing that. Before we begin, though, I must urge you to subscribe to Spectator TV, and you can do that by hitting the subscribe button at the bottom of your screen uh, and the bell icon after that to make sure that you get a reminder every time we release a new episode. Rishi Sunak may not have achieved very much in his premiership so far, uh, but one thing he has made progress on uh, is the war against smoking, which uh, we understand is something he feels quite strongly about. Uh, this week, the government confirmed that it would be banning disposable vapes and cracking down on other vape flavours and so on, which are thought to be particularly uh, attractive and therefore dangerous to children. And this is on the back of his plan, uh, which he announced at the Tory party conference, to phase out uh, smoking, legal smoking, in Britain. Uh, to discuss this, I'm joined by Kate Andrews, our economics editor, who has written a cover piece called Stubbed Out uh, for The Spectator this week, and Professor Dominic Wilkinson, who is a professor of medical ethics at Oxford University. Kate, uh, this ban, or th this move against smoking, is popular. Uh, it's one of the things the government is doing that seems to be well-liked. Um, why do you oppose it so much? Yes, you're right, Freddie. It is very popular. It's not terribly surprising, although disappointing, that the majority of people support a crackdown on the way that other people might live their lives, because we are talking about a ban for everybody on disposable vapes, a crackdown on flavoring and packaging. But that is only part of the tobacco and vapes bill, which we are expecting this month in the House of Commons. The centerpiece of that is a ban on anybody born after January 2009 from ever legally purchasing a packet of cigarettes. This may be expanded to other tobacco products. It could include cigars. It could include shisha. Uh, it could include heat not burn products. We're not sure what's going to be in those details yet. But what it seems the public support is the idea that the next generation, who can't even really be polled yet on this issue to be asked how they might feel about this, should not be able to legally purchase cigarettes. And what the cover piece looks at is not any kind of defense of smoking. I think we all hope that the next generation goes smoke free. If you are a smoker, you are likely to die earlier. You're likely to have all kinds of health complications. It's not any kind of sm pro smoking argument, it's a much more fundamental question about liberty and deciding one's own destiny and what precedent this sets. If you start bringing in two tiers of rights, not for children, but for adults, for people who will one day be 18, then 35, then 45, then 90, what if they have to live a different way? What if they don't have the same consumer rights as one of their peers, as somebody who is simply one year older than them. Is that the kind of society we want to live in? And might another government take this playbook and expand it to other areas of our lives, to food, to drink? It doesn't seem improbable that something like that could happen. So it's not a defense of smoking. It's, it's a defense of people being able in a free society, in a liberal society, to sometimes make bad decisions, to make decisions that aren't good for them. Uh, we don't want children making those decisions, and thankfully we have laws for that. Children aren't allowed to buy vapes. They're not allowed to buy cigarettes. When they're adults, should they make their own decisions? Or should the government and members of the public now make it for them? And I argue they shouldn't. They should be able to make their own choices, good and bad. 
Kate, you are an American, and to some extent, uh, liberty is or libertarianism is in your DNA, and particularly in yours. Uh, I can say that knowing you quite well. Um, does it strike you as odd that this is a British ban and that British people seem so enthusiastic about it? Because, as you say in your piece, we are supposed to be the sort of the, the country that uh, engineered uh, the Enlightenment and freedom. Yes and no. Uh, I suppose the negative answer to that is if we look at what happened during lockdown, there was huge public appetite for the government to curb freedom, for the government to uh, tell not just ourselves, but our neighbors what they can and cannot do. There was actually a poll from the end of last year, so well after the height of the pandemic, showing that roughly a quarter of respondents still wanted the rule of six, where only six people could legally meet up to gather. A quarter of people want nightclubs shut. There is that authoritarian streak that that runs uh, runs among people. Um, but I suppose I, I am surprised in the sense that, of, of course, Britain um, has, has the spirit of, of freedom. It's something that it's quite famous for all around the world. As you just said there, Freddie, a lot of the notions of freedom and what a liberal society means were thought up and founded in the UK and exported to the ex rest of the world in, in terms of those ideals. I think Americans look at the UK and, 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 and feel that way to a certain extent. Um, and in that sense, it is surprising and disappointing. I mean, for Winston Churchill, the cigar was a, a symbol of, of liberty. And there's a quote in the piece about how he saw it as a sacred right to be able to have a cigar, and unfortunately, the you know what's sacred in the UK at the moment seems to be the National Health Service. But even on that ground, it's really hard to justify a smoking ban. The tax that cigarettes brings in covers smokers, I think, three times to what they cost the NHS. Again, these aren't these aren't nice things. You know, we we don't want people coming into the NHS with diseases that they get from cigarettes. We don't encourage this. Nobody wants this to be happening. It's a question of what you're allowed to do in a free society and whether or not your age, uh, when you're an adult, not when you're a child, when you're an adult, should determine that. Dominic, uh, as a medical ethicist, can you reply to Kate's point there? I mean, does it, is this not a question of autonomy? And should we not have uh, the freedom to choose what we do with our own bodies, um, whether that's harmful or not? Well, I mean, as in many areas of life, freedom is one important value, but it's not the only important value. And there are justified limits to our freedom. One potential and one potential limit on which most people agree, though some more extreme libertarians don't, is that our freedoms are justifiably limited when they would cause harm to others. And of course, we're very familiar and Winston Churchill wouldn't, I don't think, recognize uh, um with a restriction on our personal liberty for the sake of others in terms of where people can smoke. So our, our society's changed drastically in, in where people can smoke for the very reason that one individual's choice will negatively affect other people's health. The harm to other people is one reason why we might think uh, that individual liberty could be justifiably uh, limited. Here, here's another reason. So, uh, so liberty is important, but there's another value, which is the health and well-being of our population. Our public health system is based on how do we promote people living long, happy, healthy lives. And many of the things that many of the effective ways of promoting the health of our population actually involve restricting our choices in some ways. Of course, some, some things are more restrictive of our choices than others. But when we, for example, limit where you can buy things or we put taxes on those, uh, on those products, or we require, uh, we limit advertising, or we, we put warnings on them. All of those affect our choices, often in less frank ways than a ban would, but those are restrictions on choices. Are they justified or not? Well, arguably they are if we balance uh, public health benefit. There's another significant public health argument that doesn't get uh, recognized, I think, by the, the libertarians, which is that the, the harms of smoking fall very unequally. Um, those who, uh, who, who sustain many of the, the long-term health consequences are those who are, who are socioeconomically disadvantaged. And we could talk, I'm sure, uh, at length about why that is. But the, the, the structure of our society is such that this, like many other health burdens, falls very unevenly. But the central question, if, if, if I may, um, the, the central question about freedom, I think, gets interesting in a number number of ways. So, so one is not every freedom is the same. Some freedoms are 
bigger than others. Some freedoms are more important than others. So um, if the government was talking about restricting our freedom to, for example, express our political views or uh, be part of a religion or to associate with others, those are very significant, meaningful freedoms. I, I take Kate's argument about government governmental interference, but what we're talking about here is the freedom to burn a piece of uh, a vegetation in our mouth wrapped in a piece of paper. I mean, yes, it's a sacrifice of our personal freedom, but maybe it's a freedom that's worth giving up. One of the one of the really interesting things here is that tobacco is addictive. It's intensely addictive. So what we're talking about here is a freedom. A freedom to make choices when when our choices are un, unburdened, but that subsequently become enormously affected by by the the drive to continue to smoke. And th there's a there's an argument that some of the public health people have have made that that this type of prohibition is freedom enhancing, um, and is freedom enhancing in two straightforward ways. One is it frees us from something that will restrict our freedom, which is an addiction. The second is that by giving us a longer, healthier life, it frees us in other ways. It frees us, for example, to get to see our grandchildren. It frees us to live longer, healthier lives. It, th there's an interesting uh, point that libertarians often don't recognize, which is that our freedom is often restricted by the natural world. They often talk about freedom from interference. But sometimes our government needs to do things to make us free, for example, to which the Americans don't particularly accept, to, to support our, a, a fundamental right to, to health care so that people are free by virtue of not having an overwhelming illness, not having to, to fork out to pay for basic medication. Uh, I take all those points. Uh, I think uh, rather than addressing them myself, I'll let Kate uh, uh, reply. Well, I'll, I'll jump into a few points there. So you talk about negative externalities when it comes to smoking, and I think that it's certainly, in terms of the fiscal perspective, those are more than covered. As I said, cigarette receipts in the last fiscal year brought in about 10 billion pounds, uh, and that covers smokers when it comes to their NHS costs more than three times. And it's very important that, that, you, that you address that and, and cover that. We should know that the government's plans to ban smoking for the next generation are not targeted at parents now who might be smoking around their kids or how we actually prevent kids from secondhand smoke. They're targeted at telling future adults what to do. Um, I think you make an interesting point about um, those who are disadvantaged in society, and it's an important point. Those uh, who are often affected by the negative impact of cigarettes, those who might enjoy cigarettes, might be on the more disadvantaged end of the spectrum. I do not think it is the place for people who might be in a better position to tell others how to live their lives. And um, I think that actually there's there's a real sense of of arrogance and hubris about that. And that point about happiness, I I, I want to come back to last. Um, you say that we can free people from addiction. Well, let's ban fatty foods. Let's ban salt. Let's ban sugar. Let's ban alcohol. Uh, let's ban men and women who are bad for us. Let's ban absolutely everything that we can uh, that might cause us to have a, a, a feeling of impulse, a feeling of want. Uh, it's distracting. It's not good for productivity. The idea that uh, you go around picking and choosing which addictions you don't like and perhaps which addictions you do, coffee, tea, caffeine, um, that's not for any government to decide, that's for an individual to decide. Um, you mentioned the right to health care there, and you're right, in the United States that isn't taken so seriously. It is the exception in the developed world to, to countries that, that don't take their health care seriously, particularly providing universal access to health care. That is an incredibly important principle. It should not be used as a stick with which to hit people, though. You should not be able to use your healthcare system to tell people what to do or how to live their lives. That is you living and working for the healthcare system. Um, it is you organizing your life around a healthcare system, something many of us did for, practically all of us did, for, for the better part of two years during the pandemic, but that's, that's not how we live our lives. I, I think the most important point here for me, though, is that one about happiness. I would like to live a long, happy, healthy life. I'm not a smoker, um, and that is a factor for me. I do not think I have the recipe for a long, happy, and healthy life, though, particularly 
that happy point. I don't think I have any particular recipe to tell other people how to live a happy life. I don't know why somebody might choose to smoke, why somebody might choose to smoke 20, 30 cigarettes a day. Um, I wish they wouldn't. I, I think we all know the health implications of that. I think smokers know the health implications of that. They can't pick up a cigarette packet now without knowing the health implications of that. Um, but it's not for me to tell them what kind of life to live, and it is certainly, more importantly, not for a government to ban them from doing what brings them joy, even if it's fleeting, even if it's a moment of, of happiness that they might get from that cigarette. Um, I don't think this is just an issue for libertarians or people who are on the you know, more radical end of the liberty spectrum. I think people have to sit back and think, what, what role do you really want the state to play? Do you really want the state telling adults what they can and cannot consume? And do you want them telling certain adults what they can and cannot consume? Because plenty of adults will be able to continue to buy cigarettes. It is their peers who, who won't be able to buy cigarettes. Uh, and for me, that is, a, that is a huge inequality. It's a huge problem. And it's also a playbook for a Labour Party that might decide to tackle food, that might decide to tackle alcohol, that might decide that they want to target whatever they consider to be dangerous at the time. So, you know, it might not be cigarettes for our viewers watching, it might be something else. And I, I don't think they should assume that that's safe from the nanny state when there's this new playbook going around that just says, well, you don't like it, ban it for people who can't vote yet, ban it for people who can't be polled yet, who don't have a voice, who don't have a say. I think it's really important in a free society that we stand up, and it's difficult, that we stand up for the bad options sometimes, the options to consume things you shouldn't, the options to gain weight, the options to be offensive, the options to say horrible things. These are the difficult things to defend, and these are the things that we must defend, because that is what it means to live in a free society. Dominic, uh, I might just ask you, actually, do you think that the, the arguments you put forward there in favour of banning smoking uh, would you apply them to something like alcohol or other addictive things that could be harmful? Well, it, and we, we're focused very much on alcohol, on, not on alcohol, on, on cigarettes, um, have Freudian slip peps. Uh, we're focusing very much on, on cigarettes. And I think it's important with, with any separate case to look at whether the, the arguments work, whether there are consistency-based arguments for doing the same approach or whether indeed there are there are relevant differences. Um, I, th I think we shouldn't take the the uh, be drawn into these types of slip of uh, slippery slope arguments that if if you uh, allow a, a generational ban on smoking that you're going to be led down this path to to restrictions on uh, on different types of food. And um, if we think that those are relevantly different, then we can make distinguish distinctions between them, as indeed we already do. Uh, obviously, um, uh, the the basic arguments that Cater is making in terms of people's freedoms to to make bad choices, to freedoms to become addicted, freedoms uh, to to take things that are bad for them, apply to all sorts of things that we currently prohibit, that we currently don't allow people to purchase. Um, and I think th there's a, there's this really interesting uh, tension between moves in some parts of the world towards decriminal decriminalization and liberalization of all sorts of drugs that are currently illegal uh, and, a, and a kind of uh, opposite approach towards uh, more restrictions, more uh, legal restrictions on, on drugs. I think what, one of the interesting things, uh, and I think it, it's we haven't quite got to the grips with it about the proposed ban is, is its generational nature. Um, and it's not simply about uh, imposing a ban on those who can't currently vote. It's about saying, if we're going to impose a restriction, uh, can we do so in a way that is least burdensome on the population? If, if we take those who are currently addicted, imposing a ban will be, be a very significant uh, effect on their lifestyle. It'll, it'll be incredibly difficult for them. But if we take those who are not yet addicted and we remove from them a choice, a choice that uh, that Kate's fully accepted is bad for them, um, that uh, that will likely cause them harm in the long term. That um, that many have acknowledged people will likely regret in the future. But that's importantly different. Taking away that choice 
uh, than taking away something that people already have access to. So that's the reason, that's the fundamental reason for... Why uh, not take away everything? Uh, Why not take away everything? I mean, you say the slippery slope argument is, is a bit of a stretch, but the Labour Party are already looking at food. They've been very clear about that. That might be their focus. Why not take away everything from the 14-year-olds who will want one day be 18? Why not take away booze? Why not take away high sugar products? You say they're not exposed to these things yet. Why not take those away too? Well, again, I mean, I think what, what we need to look at, to, what, what we're focused on is, is this question about tobacco. Uh, the, the harms are very, are very clear and, and except nobody uh, disputes the, the very significant health, health-based harms. It's very easy because tobacco is discreet and we can, uh, uh, we can separate it from other elements of our life. And obviously food it exists on a spectrum. It's much more challenging to, to, to say. Alcohol. To, alcohol is a much bigger killer. Why not just say now you would ban alcohol for all future 18 year olds? So the, the, the point about alcohol, of course, is, is that we would need to have a separate debate. But it, it, if it were chosen to introduce a, a generational ban on, on tobacco, that doesn't mean that we have to or that we're led to introduce a, a ban on alcohol. There, there are reasons in favor of it. There are reasons which you've articulated against it. We, we need to take each issue on its merits and not get uh, drawn into uh, thinking that we have to ban everything or nothing. Uh, we already ban uh, these other drugs. To take your argument, if we should take the libertarian approach, we should uh, immediately liberalize access to all these other uh, currently illegal drugs. Now, again, Libertarians have no problem with that, um, but there's a, there's a cost. There's a cost to people's lives, a very substantial cost in terms of their health and well-being. And we have to decide as a society how much do we va- do we value these types of freedoms against these very significant health uh, benefits. Well, I would take a more liberal approach to drugs and be consistent on that issue. I think that the idea that you would allow some people to consume certain things and allow people one year younger to not do so um, is an even bigger point here. That is the point about equality and fairness and the law applying equally to adults. And this government is going to set a precedent that it doesn't have to. And I think anybody, regardless of what they think about so, drugs or so, smoking or alcohol, should be incredibly concerned about that precedent. So, so the equality argument, I think, is is a weak one because there are all sorts of laws that we apply, we apply to to selectively to to some people. So, for example, you you have access to a pension at, at a particular age. You have access to uh, to the ability to vote or to drive or to start smoking at a particular age. Now, there's a reason for those arbitrary lines. No, 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 case. hold on. I, I want to be very clear that that's, I think that's muddling things. Everyone gets to vote at the same age. Everybody in theory, if they can pass their test, gets to drive at the same age. We are talking about a policy in which you reach a certain age and every year that it's legal is going to be one year above you. I'm not talking about the arbitrariness. Uh, yes, you're right. Why not 17? Why not 19? I'm talking about the fact that we're going to live in a world where some people can consume a legal product, some people can buy over the counter a legal product, and some people cannot. It is not the case that the voting age is gonna raise one year every year as so somebody can never reach it. It is not the case that to get your driver's license, you are going to have to reach a year in which you're never going to be able to reach. That will be true of cigarettes. That makes it fundamentally different. And, And what it means is that our children will never be in a position where legally they're able to access uh, this incredibly addictive substance. Now, the question is, is that something that we want to, to create for our children or not? Um, the, there are some good reasons. I've articulated them for thinking that's actually a, a, an incredibly good future society that we, uh, and that maybe the way to reach a future society where where people are not addicted, don't, uh, don't desire cigarettes, is via this staged process where we, have a horizon that moves away from young people now, um, but they're they're never in a position to legally access uh, cigarettes. And there are reasons to think it's Orwellian. Well, I do think uh, we are in danger of being on a slippery slope uh, towards an argument that will never end. Um, But we have to wrap it up there, sadly. It is a very interesting discussion. uh, And thank you, Dominic, for uh, coming coming on to The Spectator to uh, take uh, the position that you did. And uh, thank you, Kate, as always.
Now let's talk about the week in Westminster. And uh, it's been another uh, inauspicious week for Rishi Sunak, uh, I would say. There's been a few positive stories um, about boats, uh, illegal boat crossings going down and agreements with the French. Um, But generally, uh, the picture for Rishi Sunak is looking increasingly bleak. His personal approval ratings are getting lower and lower. Um, And there was talk this week uh, about uh, a possible coup against him. This has been, there have been murmurings of this uh, in Westminster for a while now, and they seem to be growing a little bit louder. Um, I'm joined to discuss this by Katie Balls, uh, our political editor, and Anthony Selden, who is the head of Epsom College, um, as well as a biographer of many prime ministers. Um, Katie, uh, first of all, the, the Kemi Baindok uh, sort of uh, insurrection, is that uh, a real deal? I don't think it's real yet. I think the question is, do the plotters um, have much to back their plans or their dreams? Or are they just a relatively small number of figures, some Tory MPs, some former advisers, some former Tory donors who would like to cause the Prime Minister troubles to the point they oust him, but are more likely to just cause him troubles and lead to a situation whereby it's even harder for the Tories to limit their losses, let alone turn things around at the next election. As I wrote, I think, at the beginning of the year, it did feel as though regicide is in the air. I think that has grown to a degree. But as much as we talk about these plotters who want to bring down Rishi Sunak, there's also there's almost a sense of Hoon and Hewitt to them if we go back to uh, the failed attempt to oust Gordon Brown in an election year. Because in an election year, it's, it's really hard to get rid of a prime minister. Um, the saying goes, you know, once you have had a confidence vote in your leadership, has not yet happened for Rishi Sunak, happened to Theresa May, happened to Boris Johnson. It doesn't really matter if you win it, you're on borrowed time. And that was certainly the case with uh, Rishi Sunak's predecessors. However, the point is, you could still potentially get to a point where there was a confidence vote, but then the Prime Minister has just to limp on a couple of months to an election. So it's a slightly different setting and scenario. And I think what we're seeing now when it comes to the plotters is people saying, well, we get it. You don't like Rishi Sunak. Simon Clark said he should go. No one followed him. Who do you really think is going to step in and transform the Tories Uh, you know, fortunes, if they have a situation when they go into their fourth leader in two years. That's where Kemi Bainadoc's name keeps coming up. So Anna Bravman doesn't really have the support across the party. And therefore, you have a situation where I think probably the most pragmatic or the option that would have the highest chance of working would be someone like Kemi Badenog, who would appeal to parts of the right, though not all of them, and also be able to carry some of the centre, so go votes and so forth. Now, the slight catch is as it stands, Cammy Badenoch keeps saying she does not want to be part of the plot. So you have, for example, stories today saying plotters have set their sights on Cammy Badenoch, and then you get to the third line and it says Cammy Badenoch says she wants nothing to do with the plot. So is Cammy Badenoch, who has been discovered to be in a group, WhatsApp group titled Evil Plotters, really, you know, someone who is sur- surrounding herself with evil plotters? Or is this a plot that just isn't going anywhere anytime soon? Presumably, Anthony, uh, Kemi Badenoch would be foolish uh, to sort of move against Rishi Sunak now, given that the Tories are heading for uh, landslide defeat. And so the obvious thing to do would be to wait uh, for the Tories to be beaten in general election, unless something very peculiar happens in the next few months, um, and then make a move. Uh, do you, so do you read much into it at all? So I think that uh, there is absolutely no end, no bottom to the stupidity and the total lack of uh, any historical grasp of the Conservatives. I think we have to see that not since the Conservative Party was formed in 1832 has it ever been so fratricidal and um, divided over what it believes in than it has been since 2010. It's already had five prime ministers, uh, the notion, the notion that a six will come along and suddenly find the money, which is not there, and the policies, which are not there, 
and the new voters who are not there to transform the prospects is completely uh, out of La La Land. Uh, it will be a um, fiasco if it happens. I don't think it happens. I think uh, perhaps like Katie that they are uh, positioning for what's going to happen after the likely general election defeat. Of course, Kemi Badenoch says, um, I'm nothing to do with these plotters. I mean, uh, whoever would have imagined that uh, she would be doing anything less, but she, if she really was against it, she could do much more to suppress it, wouldn't she? Uh, so I think it's all about uh, post-general election defeat uh, positioning. Uh, but I think it does say a lot about the state of the Conservative Party. I mean, what on earth does the Conservative Party believe in? Um, and... Uh, uh, when is the Conservative Party um, truly itself? Who are its stable voters? It bears almost no resemblance to the Conservative Party that was uh, in power between 1979 and 1997, or between 1951 and 1964, or the interwar years, or in the whole long Conservative century when the Conservative Party dominated the 20th century. It's uh, it's something different. To be honest, what it is, I don't quite know. I don't think, though, that anyone quite knows. Uh, Katie, can you give us a bit of an insight uh, onto the relationship between Rishi Sunak and Kemi Badenoch, if indeed Kemi Badenoch is uh, a likely uh, successor? Um, Kemi Badenoch, of course, is a former Spectator employee. Uh, and, you know, can you give us a sense of whether those two, because they have been quite uh, close in the past, have they not? Well, they've been close colleagues. I think, though famously, Kemi Badenoch was quite brutal to Rishi Sunak during the last leadership contest, when, during a debate, each of the candidates was encouraged to ask another candidate a question. And some of them went for quite silly, light things. And then Kemi, Kemi Badenoch, who had worked in the Treasury alongside Rishi Sunak, turned around and asked him a pretty hostile question on COVID fraud and why he hadn't done a better job. And I think it was after this question that the, they almost walked back from making these debates so blue on blue because of the damage it might cause coming back together after a contest. Now, of course, Liz Truss won the contest and there was more infighting to follow. Um, but I think it gives you a sign that I think Kemi Badenoch's straight talking nature, some might put it. Others, uh, I think, who are probably less fond of her might say she, she at times can be quite abrupt. Um, does mean, I, I think, that she ends up having these very direct exchanges with colleagues. I think when it comes to Rishi Sunak and Kemi Badenoch's um, relationship, now he is Prime Minister, she has um, a, you know, an important job as business secretary. Um, I think that as for how warm things are, there's definitely been reports of tensions at times when you think about things like um, the India trade deal, sometimes CPTPP, the question of being, which I think some of this is natural departments coming up against the centre, which is... Uh, a feeling that Downing Street does not consult enough, for example, or um, that is not working to the timetable of the departments, when of course Downing Street is you know, working on its own priorities. So I think a few things like that have come up. And generally, uh, those around the cabinet table can say that they find it hard to, you know, to reach the prime minister. Though I do think that has tends to be a very common complaint if you think about the past handful of Tory prime ministers we have had. Um, and then I think there's always something, which is when you are in that position, which is who, who are your potential successors? And there's always, I think, a certain power and threat in, ha in being the person who is at the top of the Conservative home, you know, cabinet league table, who is always on the higher end when the leader tends to be much more in the negative going up and down, which is currently the situation for Rishi Sunak. Uh, one of his interests, Katie, is uh, fasting. Uh, we've learned recently. Uh, we should wrap this up soon, but I wanted to get your view on this quickly. Do you think uh, it's healthy for a prime minister to not eat for 36 hours, much as we admire his slender uh, appearance? He has said he does have the occasional nut. Um, so oh. clearly he's living on the edge when it comes to that 36 hour fast. Um, Naughty. I don't suppose, when, when, when I think about Rishi and his fast, I don't think it makes him less equipped to be Prime Minister. I just presume there's something different going on with him than there is with me. I personally can not eat for 36 hours and still 
I mean, even be polite to people, let alone run a country. Um, but, but I think um, in that sense, I think he's been doing it so long. Maybe, you know, that is why he's called Tetchy is because he's not eating for such a period of time. Maybe he would have a more cheerful demeanor sometimes when he's you know, under stress from persistent questions from the press. But I don't look at him and think he looks very frail and know he's going to faint. So it isn't causing me great concern when it comes to the, when it comes to the things I would think about his premiership and where it is doing well and where it is not doing well, it, it isn't uh, top on either list. Uh, scanning through quickly in my head, I can think, come up with Stafford Cripps, who was uh, Labour Chancellor under Clement Attlee, who, who ate a lot of carrots and I'm sure fasted and had a reputation for being uh, a bit of a faddist. Uh, but look, in general, I think that um, fasting is is a great thing to do, not the least keeping as much of a distance between your uh, dinner and breakfast. We know that uh, medically that's good for you. Uh, 36 hours, I think, is perhaps push, pushing that a little bit far. Yes, I certainly need to fast a bit more. Um, thank you both very much uh, for coming on. Let's move on to Donald Trump and the trials of Donald Trump, or in particular, we want to discuss one trial, uh, or one of Donald Trump's many trials, I should say, uh, on Friday, he was ordered to pay more than $80 million to E. Jean Carroll, uh, who's a writer who alleges that uh, more than 25 years ago, um, she can't be too specific about the date because uh, she can't remember, but Trump uh, sexually assaulted her uh, and he was found to be liable for rape uh, a few months ago and then last week found to be liable again uh, for defaming her. Uh, and this is a civil, it's important to point out, this is a civil case, not a criminal case. Uh, but nonetheless, an $80 million payment is big money, even for someone like Donald Trump. I'm joined by the wonderful Lionel Shriver, our much-loved columnist, who has written a great piece about this. Again, uh, her column, always good. I'm sorry, I'm being overly flattering, but there we go. Um, uh, uh, about this this week. Um, Lionel, the headline of your piece is, Can Donald Trump Get a Fair Trial? Uh, it's a good headline, but it does seem to be a bit to one of those questions to which the answer is no. Well, almost always when, uh, when headlines are posed as a question, the answer is obvious. Half the time I don't read the article. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, next. Yeah. Um, I mean, the irony is that uh, Americans have always prided themselves on this notion that uh, all are equal before the law. And what we usually mean by that is that people in positions of privilege, who are wealthy, who are influential, are not going to be treated as if they're special. They're not going to get any concessions. They have to meet the same standards as everyone else. And this is one of those odd situations where I think being someone who is uh, influential and uh, is a, a celebrity as well as, you know, uh, uh, at this point in the polls, ad advantage to become president in the United States, this, this unusual uh, appearance of privilege is actually a disadvantage for Trump and it means that... Uh, he can't be tried like just anyone else. And there's, there's no way that anybody in any of these trials, jurors or, or judges, don't have an opinion about him to begin with. I mean, you, you're not going to be able to find a jury anywhere that, that approaches Donald Trump in a state of innocence. Yes. Well, we better be careful here in case we have to pay E. Jean Carroll uh, $80 million. I know, we should. We but should but I think, uh, I mean, let's be clear that we don't know, we can't prove or disprove uh, no. the allegation and neither can she because there's, there's no evidence uh, for it beyond her word and the testimony of two of her friends um, who th their own story got some scrutiny during the trial. Um, but what we can say is that uh, she um, is, is a, a writer of sort of uh, a lot of sort of erotic fantasy. She wrote a, uh, Hunter S. Thompson, a book about Hunter S. Thompson in which she sort of fantasized about being raped by Hunter S. Thompson. Um, she didn't, uh, I think it's confirmed now that she, in fact, I know it's confirmed now that she had the idea to uh, sue Donald Trump for rape. Uh, after uh, going to a, a resistance party, resistance being the sort of anti-Trump uh, movement. She went to a resistance party in New York and George Conway, 
uh, the husband of Kellyanne Conway, who uh, is very anti-Trump, uh, suggested it to her. Um, it's not uh, a sort of normal uh, rape uh, story, um, and it's not uh, even a normal historic rape allegation. It's a very peculiar one. And E. Jean Carroll, I think she's quite um, amusingly eccentric by the looks of her, but she is, it's, not your, it's not your kind of your, your classic story, is it? Well, first off, of course, it's too old. Um, she waited a very long time to bring these charges, and we should note that um, even in, in civil terms, uh, the statute of limitations had run out, and this case was only possible because in the wake of Me Too, uh, New York passed a law that made it possible for created a one-time window uh, for sexual abuse victims to um, bring their charges to court in defiance of the statute of limitations having run out. Uh, and I question that law. I mean, it's a classic, uh, you know, legislation passed in a state of social hysteria, speaking to the urgency of the immediate moment. And that's a formula for bad legislation. I think that uh, statute of limitations on sexual ab abuse charges are a good idea because uh, memories fade and and evidence becomes non-existent. This is a very good example. There is no uh, material evidence for this ever having occurred. Um, aside from her having confided in a couple of her friends uh, after after it, it occurred. So uh, that's why it would never have stood up in criminal court wh where you have to have uh, an overwhelming uh, certainty of guilt, whereas in civil court, it only has to be beyond 50% likely that this person is guilty. Um, which is much looser and also further makes this the size of this award absurd. I think it's worth asking the question as to whether or not uh, E. Jean Carroll would ever have brought this suit if it weren't Donald Trump. I mean, this is another example of it's, he's, not, he's not being protected because of his position. He's being attacked because of his position. Yes. And so you think it, the, the combination of it being Trump and this uh, new New York law, the adult survivors law, um, makes it impossible. But I mean, the adult survivors law could actually be problematic for anyone, really, because it depends on a on a jury. Um, and in New York, uh, you're quite likely to get a, new, a jury that would be full of people who believe who think that believe all women uh, is is a reasonable position. Um, I think of all places, Trump or someone like him does not have a chance in New York State. I mean, it's it's chock full of Democrats. Yes. And uh, and it's run by an attorney general who has pretty much uh, come to power uh, on a pledge to get Donald Trump. Yes, which seems vaguely illegal to me. I, mean, I just I don't know how that's possible that y you can. Um, and then you can run on a platform of going after a particular citizen in in the judicial system. And, I, you know, this is part of a larger uh, picture because, of course, there are those four other um, tr trials and the 91 charges that we keep hearing about. And, you know, it smells bad. I... Uh, I I agree with the what has become a mainstream view uh, on, on the right of center that uh, this is not uh, the way. Even if you want to, this is not the way to take down Donald Trump. You should he should be debated. He should be defeated in the ballot box and not not in the courts. And and I think because Democrats are not liking the look of the polls, they're getting more and more motivated to go after Trump in the courts. Uh, including by taking him off the ballot altogether, for example, in, in Colorado and Maine. And I just think this whole approach is wrongheaded. Uh, it looks genuinely anti-democratic from people who never shut up about democracy. Yes. And not only is it failing to stop Trump, it could actually help him 
win. Of course. Yeah. And, it, you know, it feeds all the paranoia on the right that the Democrats are out to get Trump by any means possible. <clears throat> and I think they're right. Yeah. Could you give us a little bit of an insight, uh, as an American who knows Britain uh, very well, um, on the ways, different ways in which Americans and Brits think about the law? Because it's often seemed to me that Americans accept at some level that their legal system is more politicised, because it is. Um, and then it means that when Brits look at legal American stories, we assume that the law has a sort of integrity that perhaps Americans don't give it. Is that a fair thing to say? Maybe, but I think that there's a politicized element in the UK also, especially now that you have a Supreme Court. Uh, the decisions around Brexit were highly political. And uh, maybe that was new to a lot of Britons, uh, that the, the courts have their own opinions. I think to completely trust any justice system as unpolitical is naive because it's run by people and people have opinions and, and, and they have certain outcomes that they prefer uh, going in. So there's, there's, there's a political element to it anyway. And the, the, all that neutrality is a conceit. Uh, so, and, you know, obviously with the situation of the Supreme Court in the U.S., uh, it, because justices are appointed by a particular president with a particular viewpoint and party, uh, so the court is, is eternally divided between liberals and conservatives. Uh, yeah, from a distance, it, it looks bad, but I don't think it's that different in the UK. Uh, and lastly, Noel, I'll know, uh, Lionel, I know it's uh, very rude to ask people how they're going to vote, and I, I won't do that directly. But uh, certainly four years ago, you supported Joe Biden over Donald Trump. Uh, I get you said at the beginning, you're not a, you're not a Trumpster. We, we, I get that. But do you really think uh, four more years of Joe Biden would be uh, uh, better than four oh, more years of Donald Trump? <laughs> I think four more years of Joe Biden will will or would be a catastrophe. I, there is no good outcome for this election unless something changes. I mean, the number of people who are convinced that at least the Democrats are going to replace Biden at the last minute is is very high. And I don't know what, I, I can't tell the difference between uh, sound intuition in this case and wishful thinking because people are so desperate that Biden not run again, and especially with Kamala Harris as his vice president. And as I understand the reasoning uh, on the Democratic side, it's, oh, you know, you, you can't uh, push Biden into stepping down because then there would be this obligation to take Kamala Harris, who would be roundly defeated against dog catcher. I mean, anybody, she, she would lose, I guarantee you, to anybody. Um, because, you know, she's part black and part Indian and she's the first female vice president and you can't insult these groups of people. I think that's a false, I think that's a false assumption. I think she's so widely disliked that that includes a huge number of black people and Indian people and women. So, uh, so that, that's, that's a false assumption. But that's that's the, that's the logic according to which you know I guess the heavies in the Democratic Party have have not leaned very hard on him to to reconsider. But uh, the, this, if it goes ahead, Trump and Biden, there is no way I'm I'm going to be happy at the end of election night. I mean I I'm going to be depressed regardless of what happens, and it's just a, a competition of of which future strikes me as slightly more horrific. And honestly, I think it's a dead heat. Well, uh, I hope we'll have uh, many more updates from you as that depressing evening approaches. Uh, thank you very much, Lionel. Oh, it's a pleasure to talk to you, Freddie. So from Donald Trump to the Middle East, uh, last weekend, three American service men and women were killed by a drone attack in Jordan 
Um, and the White House, Joe Biden's administration, were very quick to point the blame at Iran, uh, which has prompted a usual chorus of concern about Iran's activities in the region uh, and what is going on with the unravelling situation in Gaza and the ratcheting up of tensions um, all over the Middle East, seemingly backed by Iran's proxies, Hezbollah, the Houthis and so on. I'm delighted to be joined now by Charlie Gamel, who is a former diplomat and a historian of Iran and Afghanistan. Um, Charlie, do you think uh, Western security sources are too quick to immediately pin the blame directly on Iran um, whenever these attacks happen? Um, Max, lovely to be here. Uh, I would I would start by saying that that no, I don't think that's the case. I think Iran has a history going back until the 1980s of arming, uh, training, and funding these militia groups, um, and it uses it as a as a policy to help project its influence in the region. So, I think there's a degree to which one can overestimate the ties between these groups. I think particularly it, it's a sort of a sliding scale. You have this very strong, long established relationship that Iran has with Hezbollah in Lebanon. And then you have a slightly newer version of that uh, in Yemen with the Houthis. And then you have something in between with these Iraqi militias. But I think it's possible to uh, to overstate the degree of control that Iran can exert over these groups. But I think at the same time, attributing these attacks to Iran, I think is a sensible way to do this. Uh, do you think that Iran is capable of pulling them back? Because there's been quite a lot of talk, some of it coming from Israeli sources, suggesting that Iran is no longer in control of its proxies. Yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely, I think everything has to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. And the degree to which Iran can exert control over these groups, I think you'd have to look at each one. I think it's important to state that some of the Iraqi militias have said that they're going to hold off on attacks on the Americans in Iraq uh, and in the region so as not to embarrass the government in Baghdad. And I think it's important to state here that, that the relationship that Iran has with these, with these groups is so close. Um, and, and for example, in, in, in Yemen, Iran, senior Iranian ballistic missile advisors have been there for, for, for quite a long time recently. So this is, a, this is a very, very, very close relationship. There is intermarriage between some of the Iranian uh, IRGC people and some of the members of these groups, or the, the, the women of the members of these groups. Um, and that relationship is very close. There is a danger that uh, Iran is not able to control them anymore. But my sense is right now, Iran has a decent enough control over them. I think potentially the exception is the Houthis. Um, and I think there's the Houthis have sort of publicly stated that, you know, that, that they are keen to do their own thing. And even though they're friendly with Iran, they're not, they don't want to be totally beholden to Iran. And I think if there's an analogous situation here, it's the relationship between ISI and the Taliban. So for a long time, ISI, the Pakistani intelligence services, were arming and funding and training the Taliban. And that relationship was very, very deep, but, there, but it wasn't without its tensions and it wasn't without some one side doing something that, uh, that, that the ISI or the Taliban doing something the ISI didn't want to do. So I would say Iran is able to, to control these, these groups, but there is always the danger that that control goes out of out of hand or that one of these groups does something that is a mistake and actually ends up killing more U.S. service personnel. Um, so I think that's the danger. And if you look at the response from both sides, I think the, the, the Iranian foreign minister, the Iranian um, <clears throat> representative to the U.N. and the IRGC leader have all come out in the last couple of days with very similar statements, basically saying we don't want a war, but we're not fearful of a war um, and calling on the Americans to stop their threatening language and calling on the Americans to, to back down. So there's this sense that both sides are trying to have their cake and eat it. They both want to nibble up the food chain, um, but at the same time, um, they, they are saying publicly and privately, look, we, we don't want a war. And do you think Iran has become uh, stronger geostrategically since uh, the October 7th uh, attacks in Israel? Um, or do you think it's actually exposing just how many enemies uh, Iran has in the region, the Gulf states, uh, seem still opposed, even if they are nervous about what's going on in Gaza. I think that's that's a really interesting point, and I think the last time I was on a Spectator podcast, this was pre October seventh, and I was I was talking about the Ibrahim Accords, I was talking about Saudi Israeli normalization, Saudi Iranian normalization. Obviously, both of those are the very small end, um, and my sense was then was that there is a danger that Iran becomes Iran's influence in the region lessens. 
if the Palestine issue becomes less of a focal point for, for the world's attention, that's something that Iran likes to stand on and, and sort of project its influence through the region, say we're standing up for the pal people of Palestine. If America sort of fully retrenched from the region, that would become less of an issue for better or for worse. If Saudi Arabia and Israel normalize their ties, they're two huge powers in the Middle East, both of whom share an enmity of Iran. If the Ibrahim Accords had sort of continued, and I think they probably will, the Saudi-Israel Saudi normalization is probably on hold for the moment. There was a danger pre-October 7th that Iran was becoming isolated. And actually, the enemies of Iran were turning on sort of Iran, as it were. And I think that was in the context of America saying to the Saudis, look, you know, we're going to withdraw from the region. We would like to concentrate on China. Um, and we'd like you to sort of, in very simplistic terms, to sort of take control of the region. And there was a danger that Iran would become isolated as a consequence of this. So, you know, speaking to people who were at Davos recently and off the record conversations with Iranians, October the 7th has been a bit of a boon for Iran strategically because it's allowed it through its proxies to play a hugely significant role on, on, on the global stage through the Houthis in Yemen to be able to say to the Arab street, we're standing up for the people of Palestine. And also, not only are we doing that, we're actually potentially crippling um, global shipping. And we're actually putting the we're putting a really uncomfortable ball in the West's court, which is we'll stop doing this if you agree to a ceasefire. And obviously, the Iranians and the Houthis and, and everyone on that side is aware that that's a really easy position for them to take because it's very difficult for America to agree a ceasefire, given that Israel under Netanyahu won't agree to a ceasefire for as long as Hamas are in existence. And it looks like Hamas will continue to be existent. So this has been, I think, a strategic win for Iran. Um, it's and obviously off the back of its relationships with Russia and, and China. And I think it's really important to see the sort of shadow of the Ukraine conflict hanging over this conflict, because as America gets further involved in the Middle East, as potentially European or UK assets get more involved in the Middle East, both in terms of time and money, that lessens the time and money they have to spend on Ukraine. That lessens the appetite for the American electorate to be involved in two theatres in, in, in globally. So that works to Russia's advantage if war fatigue can set in on two fronts for the Americans. Exactly. And, and so much so uh, that that would add weight to the idea that Iran and possibly Russia uh, had some role or knowledge of the October 7th attacks. Uh, how much do you read into that? Um, my sense is if, if, if you look at the attacks on October the 7th, Iran is master. If you look at the way it's involved in, in Ukraine and you look at the way it was involved in Syria militarily, it uses drones. I mean, and that's a bit of a USP for Iranian sort of military SOPs. And the, the, the use of drones in that, in that war obviously was, was very kind of, had a bit of a IRGC signature all over it. And it's, I mean, I don't know for certain, but, but this obviously works to favor of, you have to look at who benefits, Russia benefits, Iran benefits. Iran has a very good relationship with Hamas. Iran helped Hamas and Damascus and Syria sort of patch up their differences in 2022. So Iran has played an important role in Hamas. And this actually works to Lebanon's interest as well. I mean, if, if, if there's a big war in Gaza, uh, Hamas can take the flak and, Lev and Hezbollah can just sort of do play the role of spoiler as opposed to the role of sort of, you know, bearing the brunt of the attack as it has done in the past. So I think if you look at who benefits and then you take your reading on that question from that, I think you could say, well, I would be surprised if there wasn't some some knowledge uh, of this beforehand. But again, that's that's not speaking from any concrete knowledge, but that's just looking at the cost benefit analysis and, and who really does benefit. And it is Russia and it is Iran. And lastly, Charlie, uh, you sort of alluded to the fact there that Israel, uh, if, if Iran is the winner uh, of this, Israel is the loser, not just because of the, the tragedy of October 7th, but because of the wider implications of the war right now. Um, Netanyahu is now a, a kind of global bogeyman uh, for many parts of the world. Um, Israel arguably has overreached. Uh, the Abraham Accords may be revived, but they're certainly on pause at the moment. Um, is it essentially a case of when Iran wins, Israel loses and vice versa? I think a lot of that depends on what American involvement in the region looks like going forward. And, and, and I think, you know, Blinken's a very astute diplomat. Um, Biden's got a lot of experience in this regard. The UK will, will play a big role in that in trying to sort of go a little bit sort of to the status quo ante pre-October the 7th. I think that Israel, you know, as UK, US troops and Western troops found in Iraq and Afghanistan, when you are involved in a messy counterinsurgency, at some point you have to start asking, why are these people fighting us? And I think that that, which and what does that involve? That involves looking at the West Bank, that involves looking at Gaza. 
And that's where I think the Americans have been quite wise, even though it looks like it's an incredibly futile thing for Blinken to talk about the two-state solution while the Middle East is sort of going up in flames. I think tying U US policy to the two-state solution is as sensible an option as you can get in this regard. But in terms of does Iran win or does Iran lose if Israel loses, um, I, I don't know. I think Iran Iran can be seen as a sort of strategic genius or, or, or a blunderer. I often think it's somewhere in between. And I think that they're very good at playing the role of spoiler, how good they are at playing the role of sort of actually a constructive role in the region to bring things to a peaceful conclusion with buy-in from all parties. I'm not sure, given the length of enmity and the sort of the depth rather of enmity that exists in this conflict, I'm not sure how positive a role Iran can play in that. But but I think Israel has got a, an uphill struggle at the moment in Gaza, should it continue to want to to achieve the aims that it set out to the, to the start, which is to sort of destroy Hamas completely, which I'm not sure is possible. Charlie Gamble, thank you very much for your um, fascinating insights. Now, let's look to China and uh, the Chinese leader Xi Jinping, who is arguably or perhaps probably uh, the most powerful person in the world. And yet, we don't really know an awful lot about the way he thinks uh, and who he really is. Uh, there's a useful new book that has come out called The Political Thoughts of Xi Jinping, and it's written by two academics, uh, Steve Tsang and Olivia Chung, and they have uh, tried to sort of distill um, Xi Jinping's thoughts from various CCP documents uh, that have been produced, which are, uh, which tend to be impossibly boring and difficult to read. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Charles Parton, who is a former diplomat uh, and an associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute. Um, Charles, uh, you've reviewed this book in The Spectator this week, and you start the re review by saying you were once asked um, to sort of sum up Xi Jinping's thinking in one word, and you, you came up with the word solipsistic. Uh, can you explain why you chose that word? Yes, well, I don't mean in the strictly philosophical sense, sense of the word, but I mean in, in the sense that it's used in, in, in sort of uh, common conversation, uh, namely supremely self-centred and thinking that the whole um, world role and its reality re revolves around um, China and Chinese thinking. Yes. And in this book, we get a little sort of insight into that uh, solipsism. Uh, and you make, you make a good point about how boring uh, these and difficult to read these documents are. I think you quote someone saying uh, it's like eating uh, rhino sausage, I think was the, the term. Um, wh wh why are, I just want to ask, why do you think these documents are so impenetrable? Um, is it half deliberate? Uh, is it just how propaganda works when it's been going on for so long? I don't think they're in, impenetrable to the um, to most Chinese who are used to brought up on this diet of rhinoceros sausage, um, and they're not necessarily impenetrable to, to the likes of Steve Tsang and, and Olivia Chung and those of us who spend our life munching away at, at this rather strange diet. Um, I mean, I think the first thing to say about it, of course, is it's in Chinese, which is a very difficult language, and uh, Zhou and Lai used to say that was the first level of coding. Um, but then, of course, you've got a lot of Marxist doctrine that you've got to get your mind around, uh, and you've got to get your mind around many of the slogans and expressions that the, the Communist Party intends to simplify its thought into. So it, it might talk about the seven don't speaks, and you have to understand what the seven don't speaks are, uh, or, or, or the two becomes. So there's a certain amount of uh, hard graft you, ha you have to do to begin to read these things. Uh, what are the seven don't speaks? Well, um, this is probably one of the most famous Chinese documents of the last decade. It came out in April 2013, and it's known uh, colloquially as document number nine, because that was its number, central document. But it, it lays out the seven values of the um, main seven values that underpin Western society uh, and, and excoriates them all and says that good communists and others uh, should, should uh, stew these and uh, see, see things from the up through true eyes of the Chinese Communist Party. So things like media freedom or uh, independent justice or um, uh, our Western economic system, or political system, to totally not, not, not to be followed. You shouldn't speak about them. Or think about them. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, one term you mentioned in the review, uh, and forgive me if I'm pronouncing it wrong, is Chan Zia, uh, which translates as everything under heaven. 
um, and this is an important concept for Z uh, and, and the CCP. Um, could you explain what that's all about? Yes, um, the, the, the pronunciation, if I may, is Chen Xia, but, but um, it was a good approximation if uh, that doesn't sound too uh, patronizing, sorry. Um, but yeah, uh, so this comes in the, in the, in the section on, on, uh, on foreign relations. And uh, the, the concept of Chen Xia is a very old one, goes back many centuries, uh, where the Chinese perceive or perceive an ideal world in which China is central, in which the emperor um, rules serenely and engages to the benefit of um, the non-Chinese beyond beyond uh, beyond China, uh, and it, you, you get peace and prosperity provided that you basically toe the line and, and, and don't go against China's interests. So that's that's the basic concept. Um, don't don't rock the boat and certainly you know, don't rock the Chinese boat, and, and everything will be well. And finally, Charles, do you think uh, that Z is tremendously bright? He's obviously very uh, intelligent. You know, you don't get to lead uh, a world superpower without having quite a lot of cunning and, and, and ability. Um, certainly, he seems to have a lot of organisational ability. Um, but this solipsism you speak of speak, it speaks to a kind of limited mind, does it not? Well, yes, I think you're absolutely right to say that he's um, very sharp politically. I mean, the way he has elbowed his way to to supreme power, to a position where he really is um, up there with, with, with Mao in, in terms of um, you know, personal power, etc. Uh, that bespeaks um, a very great determination, uh, a very clear idea of how to, how to attain it, and a, a complete ruthlessness. Um, but a lot of people within China um, say, well, he's not that bright. He doesn't really understand the economy and the economies in any country, I suppose, is the most important thing. Um, you know, that we, we don't have a, a, a great deal of insights into that, but one of, one of the best ones is actually on, on WikiLeaks as an American cable talking about um, someone who grew up with uh, in the same sort of milieu as Xi Jinping. Uh, and generally then, he wasn't seen as particularly bright. And, um, but, but, you know, what he was, was, was very loyal, despite his personal background of his father having been persecuted extremely badly by the Chinese Communist Party. Um, one might say an almost a Stockholm syndrome. But but he's, um, and, and I think also, you know, how bright is he? He's made a few mistakes. I mean, COVID's an obvious example. I, I would say that um, throwing off Xi Jinping, uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping's policy of hide and bide on the foreign stage a little bit early, frankly. Um, it's a bit like playing political grandmother's footsteps. I mean, you don't rush to, to touch grandma until you're sure that you can get there before they turn around. Well, the West has turned around and, and, and become very um, anti-China as a, as, a, as a result of, I think, breaking cover too early. So there's plenty of mistakes there. Um, but politically, uh, there's one sharp elbow cookie. And are those mistakes an opportunity uh, for the West? I mean, is, is the fact that Xi Jinping is not some Bismarck uh, of the 21st century, uh, does that suggest that perhaps China's rise is more stoppable um, than we might assume? Well, um, I, I, again, you know, it depends what you mean by China's rise. One wishes all prosperity upon the Chinese people, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, and actually, to me, I think the, the biggest um, in, impediment to their rise is their economic system and the fact that I don't think it is possible um, under that sort of system eventually to to uh, have an economy that is sustainable enough to to to, to um you know promote the sort of uh, one world domination if that doesn't sound too dramatic that, that xi jinping is is aimed for you can't be the number one superpower unless you've got a, a highly successful economy and we're now seeing the economy entering the phase that was predicted by a number of us which, which said that um, you know the economic model is is broken and that's what Xi Jinping himself said back in 2013 when he introduced all these economic reforms, about sort of you know, 385 reforms under, under 60 chapters, God knows what. But they haven't been implemented. Now, if, it, if he was saying it was broken 10 years ago uh, and you haven't changed it, then I think it's fair to conclude it's still broken. Uh, and I think we're seeing that in, in, in the problems that they're running into now. So, um, you know, other factors, I think the West 
free and open countries, because it's not just West, Japan, India, and, and other countries, are beginning to see the problems and the threats and are taking measures against it. So, you know, when you say, is this an opportunity? The thing about opportunity is that that sounds rather positive. And I, I, I don't think that's the picture we have. I mean, we have a, a world which I'm afraid is, um, you can call it de-risking, if you like, or diverging or decoupling or anything beginning with D. But it, it we're all going to be poorer as a result. Um, but nevertheless, not as poor, I suspect, both spiritually and possibly economically, as we might be if Xi Jinping's vision came to full fruition. Uh, on that uh, slightly terrifying note, thank you very much, Charles Parton, for coming on to Spectator TV. That is it from Spectator TV. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you found it uh interesting and entertaining, a little bit entertaining anyway. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, you must subscribe again to remind you uh, to do that. You hit the subscribe button at the bottom of the screen, join uh, well over 300,000 um, people who already do that, uh, and then hit the bell icon to get the reminders uh, whenever we release a new episode. That's all for now. Uh, thank you very much. Please come back next week. Mm -hmm.